thank you everybody for coming on this uh, weekday afternoon and um, thank you Helen for the introduction and thank you um, dear Ziba for making this exhibition and uh, all of you for being present. Um, the title of the uh, talk is a bit um, like dropping a bomb, I realized in the last few weeks uh, from feedbacks that I had from uh, the social media, the eternal feminine is such a, a far-fetched um, title, which um, I think before I start, I would need to um, give a bit of um, background to it. I use the title of the eternal feminine because um, the, as you know, and probably as you have read um, in the catalog of the exhibition and in the introduction of the um, Spark Is You, this year is the 200 year anniversary of the Ves Aslija Divan, written by Goethe. And the concept of the um, eternal feminine was a term that was used by Goethe in a moment where none of the concepts of feminism and um, political um, ideas around um, uh, femininity in relation to political life were not as explored and ex exploited as of today. So I wanted to um, 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 uh, take that term and bring it in relation to uh, what I think among many other things that um, Goethe uh, didn't understand about the Persian culture in his um, attempt to translate it to German language and to European um, uh, culture um, was a key um, concept. And that, that concept, that idea, that mode of being, um, in short, in my opinion, uh, is Shahzad. So um, if you go through the text of West Ostrische, you see so much of fascination and almost surprise at every line by Goethe. He, he is shocked. He constantly asks, how come did you, how come do, do you write like this? How come, how, how come Hafez, do you explore the language like this? So I first encountered that text in 2000. 12, um, you know, Iranians have this tradition to um, sit together and, um, uh, and from their memory tell poems and uh, it's like a competition. It's like a, uh, we call it Mosha Ere. So I say a verse and you should answer with the verse that is starting with the last letter of the last verse. So my mother family are, uh, is from Shiraz, the city of Hafez. And um, in 2012 or 13, um, with a Skype with multiple members of the family from uh, different parts of the world, we were, um, we were doing this game and I wanted to cheat because I had run out of poems to respond. Uh, and I looked up Shiraz and I, and I came across a translation of Goethe's line, Wes Aslisha Divan, about Shiraz and about Hafez. Um, as saying, saying as, um, how come your Shiraz, Hafez, immigrated to the north misty lands of Gawain? Gawain is a region that Goethe is writing about. And I was shocked. I was like, how, how, the, my Shiraz is so central to the idea of um, the book for Goethe. And from there on, I realized there are so much residues from the writings of Hafez that Goethe as a translator, as a, as a, as a scholar of Hafez could not um, understand. Uh, Goethe was shocked at the condition of uh, uh, the forces within the text of Hafez, but the context from which the poems of Hafez was, um, was, had emerged was not something very clear, not, not for him, neither for many other Orientalists um, uh, who came after Goethe, like Fitzgerald or, um, or people like Emerson or uh, many more. So from that moment, I became one, more interested in that context. And that context um, led me to more 
um, breathing into the works of um, scholars such as Dr. Dabashi, Dr. Hamid Dabashi from New York, or uh, Dr. Taba Tabai, who they all, and then Encyclopedia Iranica. They all centered their work, works around the concept of adab. Adab, as mentioned in, in, uh, in the introduction of um, the event tonight, um, is, a, is a term which means aesthetics, but also ethics. So, adab is a, is a Middle Persian word, meaning container, which travels from Middle Persian at the rise of Islam to Arabic language. In Arabic, it undergoes multiple transformations and it finds new formats and plurals like adabiyat, like adab, muadab, ta'adib. Um, and then it returns back to not only Persian, but also later to Urdu and Turkish and Hindi. Um, so many parts of India, f instead of saying salam, which is an Arabic way of saying hello, um, they say adab. Adab is the uh, greeting as, uh, as much as it is salam for people like Iranians. Um, and I will not explore the idea of adapt today because as um, in my conversations in Amsterdam from 2014 onwards, I understood and uh, it was suggested to me by John Welshman and many, many, many people helped me to go through all these conversations to, uh, to undertake this research. John Welshman told me, for the rest of your life, you're going to be busy theorizing what ADAP is. But then you're going to come up with an example of ADAP so people can understand you. And at, at the first second I knew Shahzad is the example of ADAP. Shahzad is the person who incorporates aesthetics to turn the Madden king into an ethical person. And I just summarized the story of 1001 Nights so everybody can understand, uh, know, would know what I'm talking about. So, we have Shahriyar. Shahriyar mean, meaning um, the friend of city, but also king. Um, Shahriyar has a wife. The wife betrays him. He goes mad. He promises to kill all the virgins of the city one after another by marrying them and executing them the morning after until the smart Shahzad um, asks her dad she would need to be married to the king so she can rescue all the women of the city. Of course, the father isn't very uh, pleased with the um, demand of the daughter, but then eventually accepts. Shahzad starts a game, makes a planning with her sister Dinazad. They two engage in a conversation. They, they, Shahzad asks the king, um, uh, as the last wish of her, if Dinazad can be invited to the palace and she would tell her a sto an unfinished story for her little sister. And the king, of course, is overhearing them. And through this, not addressing the king, but addressing the sister, these two women uh, engage in a conversation. So Shahzad tells the stories and Dinazad asks, about, uh, asks Shahzad, so what about this part of it? What about that part of it? So the king is engaged right away. The night isn't, uh, hasn't ended, but the story has ended. Therefore, Dinazad says, oh Shahzad, can you please tell another story? So they start another story, but before the story ends, the sun rises and the king has to leave for doing the daily job, of the, the kingly job. Um, therefore, he postpones the execution of Shahzad. To everybody's surprise, she's the first um, um, lady of the first queen of the period, basically, who isn't um, executed. And the story goes on for 1001 night until through the stories of Shahzad, the king hears all these stories that little by little softens him. And then at the end of the story, we have three sons of Shahzad from Shahriyar and the king who is sorry for what he was up for 
asks for apologies, and the very connotation of Shahzad not having a daughter is going to be exploited by Dr. Humayunpur on 2nd of July here, um, who is a psychoanalyst in Iran and working on the other aspects of the concept of Shahzad. But with Dr. Humayunpur, we also have been in, I'm, I'm a student of her, I'm analyzed by her, and it's been a, if I, if I am able to talk about Shahzad, it's because unbelievably smart, intelligent Iranian women like her have been uh, my mentors. And I have been since childhood looking at them and seeing how, how they go about and around things and get things done without anybody understanding what is happening exactly. So I'm not going to tell all the truths today to you, like in the matter of Shahzad. I hope that it will be um, seductive enough, like how the story of Shahzad was, to keep you engaged but not exploiting it fully. I need to mention Borges before going to um, Bahram Beizai, who is also another mentioned person in the introduction. Jorge Luis Borges uh, has a lecture in his hometown about 1001 Night and the influence of 1001 Night on the Western literature. For him, the moment 1001 Night is translated into European languages, anything of the literary tradition of the European uh, uh, literature is out of fashion. You don't have, you, nobody reads anymore after Shahzad and 1001 Night any of the texts written before, through first the Latin translation uh, by a French guy who adds three other stories to 1001 Night and Borges wants to prove that you cannot say if that is an original 1001 Night or not, because any story added is just, I mean, 1001 Night from the very beginning was the uh, collective work of many people. In, within the story, we also hear that Shahzad in the mornings goes to the city and asks and gathers, collects stories from um, elderies of the town. And I'm not going to uh, touch on post-colonial critic of the European translation because um, that's not anything in relation to the theoretical mode of artistic production that is in the idea of the knights. Um, from there, there is only one time mentioning of the thousand myths in a footnote by, by Borges, where he says, we know that the origin of um, the knights is found in a book called Hazar Afsan, Thousand Myths. But then he doesn't mention where the book comes from. Within the research of, uh, and it, that is the moment that Mr. Beizai realizes not only Borges, but no other um, literary scholar of the Persian language in the last uh, 100 years, 100 year, has researched the origin of 1001 Night. It's known as Arabian Nights, and Dr. Um, uh, Borges and Beizai both um, acknowledge that this is not Arabian Nights. That if, if anything, uh, 1001 Night is a transnational story, but with a Persian root. But Beizai shows that the 1001 Night already exists as a tradition within the people of where we call Persia, when already Alexander arrives to Iran. So we are talking much before Islam. We are talking about 1500 years before Islam. Um, where then he realizes as an artist that he has to do the research. So the book of the genealogy of the ancient tree and the um, uh, where is thousand myths by Bahram Beizai are his research on the origins of 1001 night and the mythological background of it. He realizes um, in Shahnameh, the Book of Kings, which is the collection of the Persian epics, uh, and then in the, uh, Avesta, in the Zoroastrian uh, holy book of uh, pre-Islam, you have um, Shahnavaz and Arnavaz versus 
Zahak and Feridun, uh, who, who are separated figures of the good and bad king. And before that, in uh, Avesta, you have Sange Havak and Arve Havak, from the water and from the earth. And on the other hand, you have the dragon of drought. So he looks at the agricultural, mythological construction of how these early settlers of this region would look at the sun, the water, the war, etc., etc. In my work, though, where you look at the fabulous theology of Kuhenur and the fabulous theology of Daryoyanur, I'm going to touch on the fabulous theology in a second, but Kuhenur and Daryoyanur occurred to me through the long conversations I had with uh, Dr. Aldalan that should be related to Sangya Havak and Arvel Havak. Then I looked at the patterns of the history of these two diamonds, and I realized, strangely enough, these people, from Brits all the way to, to Iranians, Afghans, Indians, anybody who started naming these two specific diamonds with this semantic value, um, unconsciously knew, unconsciously thought that by um, capturing these two diamonds, they would be able to run the world. In the time of Greeks and Persians, you already know, they, they think when, when someone um, occupies another land, they say, bring the soil and the water. And the soil and the water are always embodied in two wives of the king. And this is the same all across Europe, Persia, and India. All the Indo-European culture um, give this semantic value to, uh, to, to the ownership of the land. Beizai also shows how in different times of uh, history, with different ethical uh, codes and with um, moments where patriarchy is winning over matriarchy or the other way around, you have more agency given to different uh, figures of this mythology. So at times, uh, Feridun is more agent than Shahnawaz and Arnawaz, like in uh, uh, Shahnameh. In Shahnameh, there is no agency given to Shahzad. In the Thousand and One Night, which in my opinion is a compromise formation of the uh, uh, Iranian and the Semitic cultures that were through Islam and all, the, all that is going on in around seven, eight, ninth centuries, um, you would get a compromise formation where the aesthetic and the ethical get related through the engagement of Shahzad and all those other people who know they will not going to have this Greek idea of the Republic where the artist is free to do whatever. The artist should silently, in a silent diplomacy, engage in seducing with uh, whatever medium, which traditionally becomes uh, uh, either storytelling or having a painting and then telling a story in front of it, little by little incepting ideas that they want, that the king would um, uh, grant them. Now going back to the fabulous theology. There's a very important sentence um, around San Augustine, where in San Augustine and the other monotheist figures of history, the world of myths died. So we are li the, the attempt of um, uh, monotheism in Europe and in Persia and in India and the Semitic world has been so totalizing that we are not anymore in touch with our fabulous theologies. Fabulous theology in Latin is uh, Theologia Theatrica. Um, Pierre Kolosowski, who was a, a teacher of philosophy, teaching uh, teacher of people like Foucault or Deleuze, he has been brother of Balthus, the painter, and then at, at 49 he starts uh, pa becoming a painter after he writes The Living Currency, La Monnaie Vivante, after that book, um, for, the, for the first few decades of his life engages deeply in as many the theologies as possible. To be a, and not to become a Christian or a Jewish or a Protestant, but to see how he can undo 
these monotheist uh, Abrahamic religions to then go back to see what was this multiplicity of the theologies that were active in Europe. So I tried to do the same in the last few years because through the realm of Adab, Adabiyat literature, you see a lot of Shiism, you see a lot of Judaism, uh, you see a lot of Mizrahi literature, you see a lot of um, um, uh, uh, Zoroastrianism, Mitraism, and at the end of the day, these are one way or another all patriarchic, monotheist theologies. But then underneath this, you realize there are residues of matriarchic Noruz, Anahita, um, uh, or um, holy prostitution, as Bahram Beizai mentions. So I try to engage in what Kolosovsky does with European theologies and pre-Augustinian theologies uh, to be done to the Persian theology, Persian culture. Um, so there, there was where I reached again for, I don't know how many times, but it was a repeated um, refinding, um, the religion of Mani, M-A-N-I, Manichaean religion. Manichaean religion was a third century religion uh, compromi comprised of Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Christianity. It was um, a polytheism, and it was re-emergence of a religion that already uh, had emerged three centuries before it, called Zorvanism. For this specific, these two specific installations, I've been contemplating on Zorvan. Zorvan means time, zaman. Zorvan is the god that gives birth to Ahura Mazda and to Ahriman. Zorvan first contemplates the idea of giving birth to a god that will rule the world, but while he is having faith in this good god, he has a moment of doubt that gives birth to Ahriman. So the follower of, followers of Zorvan believed for, for going through the world, you can not only uh, pray to the good God, you need to also pray to devil, because devil is the one who gives you doubt, therefore freedom. Fantastic, unbelievable set of uh, thoughts and theologies that re-emerges as Manichaeism in third century in Persia, um, a religion which surprisingly says, because we are not this monotheist, pure, divine um, uh, immanence, we have to come to terms with our mundane, uh, bodily, banal, uh, uh, material existence as well. Therefore, the holy message cannot be only given through logos, it must engage painting, music. Um, uh, architecture, rituals, dance. Very little is written about this, but uh, Sir Arnold's Ehwal Lahuri, and um, uh, in his latest book, Siamak um, del um, Zende uh, in Iran, uh, in the book of Tavolat Tasviri, uh, uh, Iran, have touched upon, uh, uh, upon it like here and there. But for me, the engagement with Manichaean um, religion was also superimposed on the psychoanalytic methodology, which I started studying since I was 19. I cannot separate these two practices for myself because the moment I decided to become a painter was also the moment that I decided to undergo psychoanalysis and study it. So to me, they went hand in hand. Um, and I'm not talking about psychoanalysis as one idea. Psychoanalysis is climate of ideas with multiplicity of traditions and directions. Um, but at the end of the day, I reached two people, Leo Bersani and Jean Laplanche. Leo Bersani's text called Thought, Thoughts and Things and Jean, Planche, La, Jean Laplanche's text called The Unfinished Copernican Revolution. I will try to finish with these two texts in relation to the fabulous theology and the content that is the Kuhenur and Daryoenur from the water and from the earth so that um, it would make sense for you um, the 
headlines of the, th the thoughts, the ideas, the theories, and the philosophies that I had in mind, and then you feel free, please, to um, give me your comments or questions, and I can elaborate further. Um, Jean Laplanche, in the Unfinished Copernican Revolution, criticizes Freud uh, in his text where he tries to, uh, Freud has a text called um, Three Deadly Damages to Human Narcissism, where he takes um, Copernicus as the first person who decentralizes the vision of man, the second is Darwin, and the third himself. And Laplanche says Freud is wrong. Freud is only right when he talks about um, Copernicus himself, because indeed Copernicus decentralizes the Earth from being the center of the universe. Uh, Kant writes about this. This becomes the foundational canon for whole scientific uh, revolution in the Western world and the rest of the world. Any rationality uh, enter um, um, enterprise needs to look at this canonical uh, revolution. Yet Freud's reading of Darwin for Laplanche is a recentralization of the man who is not anymore a divine man, nonetheless is a still the center of the animal kingdom. So he says this is not Copernican because Freud is taking humans again as a center. My suggestion is that um, only through looking at the wings of the birds, Freud could decentralize humans from the uh, being a center to the uh, kingdom of um, animals. Um, and you can see that throughout all history, how we have been always envious, seduced by birds, those who can fly. And we knew already unconsciously, we are not as good as we think because we cannot fly, right? The third one is more important and more in relation to this story. Freud doesn't start right away with Oedipus complex. He first starts with seduction theory. And in seduction theory, he thinks that every child is culturally seduced by the cultural attention to a specific erogenous zones. We know the story. So for him, it's not essentially biological that we repress some stuff. It is also the cultural attention we give to a specific body parts that makes it more important for the child. But then very soon he really, really gets intimidated by his own theory and he drops the seduction theory and he never touches it again. So for Jean Laplanche, he goes back to early Freud and he says basically, Freud, if wants to be a Copernican scientist, has to decentralize the self and take the ego out and say the other, you are always my center. You are seducing me by fear, by sexuality, by, by pleasure. Uh, it's always the other that is uh, the, the center of my mindset and I'm orbiting around. I, my ego tries to recuperate this decentralization nonetheless. The, the, vec the direction of the vector of attention is always to, towards the other. So by this re-establishing Freudian ideas, but through the seduction theory, Laplanche opens the uh, contemporary psychoanalysis to go back to earlier, more radical ideas of Freud than Oedipus complex, where it takes the ego as the center of the self. This text was very important for me. This text was the moment that I could bring Klosowski's mythological um, uh, readership, theological uh, in, uh, implications through either Marxist theory, because also Marx has a very important chapter which is very overlooked, where he talks about the uh, spirit of the objects. The, uh, spirits of the, uh, the uh, spirit of the object is more influential on me as a commodity, as the, uh, the value of the commodity itself. And there, from there, Klosowski takes that and takes the body of the humans as commodity too. So it's not that for Klosowski the failure of um, whole Marxist theory is that it is not understanding how much each human body is a, a useful sexual object for the other human. This is outrageous for classic Marxism, but nonetheless uh, Klosowski is unapologetic with it. And through the living currency, Klosowski establishes uh, 
that the body of the artist, the body of the person who is in the business of supply and demand is the one who can make available or unavailable this currency that is the body of the artist that can give pleasure to people who by uh, subscribing to uh, nine to five work have um, given up the voluptuous pleasure and the satisfaction that can be uh, procured by attending what the artist uh, uh, procures for himself. So to conclude, Um, I wanted to, I, my work was and is and will be busy with 1001 Night. Um, it will be busy with ADAP and this uh, question uh, where ADAP is shifting from literature to be more of a cinematic or a visual art or a music question. So ADAP wouldn't be confiscated by adibs of adabiyat, but adab will be given more in the hand of cinematographers and painters. But at the same time, I wanted to have something in relation to uh, Goethe's text that I have been busy since 2013 with, in relation to something that would be pulling the strings for the Anglo-Saxon audience, the ones who are familiar with some um, um, signifiers that are shared signifiers between the Persianate and the, uh, the um, uh, Anglophone world. Th that is where I could see that Zorvan, Ma Ma Manichaean ideas, dualism, Shahnavaz and Arnavaz are so present in the diamond of Daryayanur and in the diamond of Kuhanur that are one in Tehran, one is in Tehran, one is in um, um, London. And then I was just wondering, how, what is the, why, why this concretizing, this, um, 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 this, this, this trajectory that these two stones uh, have till now, how can we go against it? So the way that everybody agreed that if you have these two women or these two um, stones, you can rule the world, how can we just undo it? How can we go against it? How can we look at it like uh, Godard looks at a story, at a, as a th as, at, at a theory? That is where I started thinking um, any set of unmaking of the signifier of Kohenur and Daryayanur in relation to its theological um, implications um, would work. And I don't think that these two are the unique uh, example of it. These are just two examples. I'm sure that any other artist, any other person, thinker can engage with the idea of Kuhenur and Daryayanur. But then the signifiers for me, the seduction of the color, the seduction as a mode of um, uh, functionality and agency within art, and then the syntax as something that is um, of, of uh, cinematic installation uh, was, the, uh, was the answer for me. The final result happened here uh, at this space. Um, I don't claim any originality to the installation because to me, when the curator, when the audience engage with me and they tell me about their experience, it just um, uh, refines the result for me. But um, for most part of it, I'm just happy that um, through the support of uh, Ziba and the um, whole team, I could engage with this question that has been so central to my um, cultural, political um, engagements and um, give the result to you. Thank you for your attention.